Yes, I did take down Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> I have some more books to write. No, that one wasn't very well timed. And, and um, it, let me, uh, I, I have a few little political barbs and comments I'll make throughout the speech tonight, so I'll skip some that have been uh, teed up already. Let me, let me start by just saying I really am very, very grateful to be here. I, I do want to thank New St. Andrews College and everyone in the Moscow, Idaho community for inviting me to deliver the commencement address this evening. I consider an honor to be with you. I look forward to addressing you with a message that I dearly care about. But truth be told, a big part of me accepted the invitation because I was hoping to see a story leak that resulted in a headline somewhere saying, Republican donor goes to Moscow to influence the 2020 election. <laughs> or something to that effect. The news headlines have moved on to other, other areas. Um, but I am grateful to just the men here tonight, the women here tonight, and everyone else. But really, I actually thought, see, it takes a minute here. In California, they would just say, like, yeah. It's, it's. <laughs> really, I actually thought our time together tonight may have been canceled. And I don't just mean the delay that we experienced in May around COVID. But about a week or so, I started getting all these tweets and texts and things popping up on my phone alert saying, Christian college president forced to resign over a scandal. And, and I thought to myself, oh, no, what has Dr. Merkel done? <laughs> But of course, it, it turned out to be Jerry Fall Jr. of Liberty University who posted pictures of himself at a wild party on a yacht with scantily clad younger women and drinking what looked to be alcoholic beverages. And the initial defense to the accusations and the hubbub was, no, 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 it was not really alcohol. That was just a brown liquid meant to look like a cocktail. And once I heard that, I knew it wasn't Dr. Merkel. But, but think about this for a second in all seriousness. If you're looking for a quintessential reductio ad absurdum of modern antinomianism, a married man is caught with provocative illicit pictures with a younger woman and the first line of defense, surely satisfying by the way to many fundamentalists who had been grieved with concern, was that the cup only had Diet Coke in it. We don't live in interesting times, as the Chinese say. We live in ridiculous times. 2020 is becoming a peak point for the ridiculous. And speaking of what the Chinese say in 2020, allow me just to say, just get the chicken soup, please. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. OK, I guess I should start my speech now. I am serious that the topic is extremely important to me. And I hope we'll provide some memorable inspiration for you, graduates, as you embark upon the next phase of your life. I've titled my address 100 Years at a Time, and I think it is useful to address the graduates of 2020 in this tremendously challenging year of 2020 about a vision for cultural change and transformation in a century-long perspective and context. To do this, I want to talk about the last century, and see if we can't learn a few things that will guide you into this new century. See, I have high hopes for the next 80 years, and there's not a lot of people that have high hopes right now about the next 80 days, let alone the next 80 years. But I'm going to need your help in some of what I yearn for and some of what I truly believe will come to pass. Talking tonight prescriptively and descriptively. But based on the first 20 years of this century, 20 years that I imagine more or less coincides with the total time on Earth many of you have thus far experienced, it may seem that my vision for the next 80 years is a fantasy relative to how we have started this thus far highly unsettling century. For those in their young or mid-20s, your entire lives have basically been bookended by A, the terror attacks of 9-11, and B, the COVID pandemic of 2020, two of the most significant events in modern American history. And in between, we did have the largest financial crisis and economic contraction since the Great Depression. So on a pure milestone basis, the first 20 years of national life has been, this century has been defined 
By paradigmatic shifts in national security and the reality of global and existential threats against our country, in a devastating unwinding of unfathomable amounts of financial leverage that invited an entirely new relationship between the citizen and the state, between the citizen and our central bank, and now a viral pandemic that has brought about the previously unfathomable. And of course, I refer to national sheltering in place orders, state sanctioned shutdowns of church, an almost universal cessation of economic activity, and worse than anything any of us could have imagined, the cancellation of USC's 2020 football season. Are we really sure that Satan has been bound? But before we really unpack the challenges of the last 20 years on the global stage, perhaps we could look to the immediately preceding century and see if we can't learn something. 1900 to 1920 and 2000 to 2020 have an uncanny amount in common. Sure, the Spanish-American War of 1901 is not totally fair to compare to 9-11. It actually started in 1898 and ended before Teddy Roosevelt came in. But it did represent a profound conflict of serious global ramifications and uncertainty. But if the Spanish-American War doesn't float your boat, hopefully World War I does, at least better than it did some boats, the post-financial crisis events of 2008 certainly redefined the role of the Federal Reserve in modern economic life, but not as much as the creation of the Federal Reserve did in 1913. The financial crisis of 2008 was brutal, but so was the financial crisis of 1907. And if you thought the COVID moment of 2020 has been rough, imagine the actual Spanish flu of 1918 and 675,000 American deaths that it represented, a huge portion of which, by the way, were babies and toddlers. There's been no, I'm off script now. It disgusts me that there's been no mention at all through all of the sensationalism and fear mongering about this COVID moment, which of course is a tragedy and has taken too many lives. No mention at all of the gratitude or the blessing that babies and toddlers have been almost entirely spared. It's almost like they refuse to acknowledge it. And yet the comparisons to Spanish flu on that moment, on that point alone, are offensive when hundreds of thousands of babies were lost. That's in America alone, worldwide millions. Back on script. The first 20 years of our century has seen continued ascendancy for communist China, but the first 20 years of the last century saw the creation of communist Russia, climaxing with the Bolshevik Revolution and the culmination of Lenin's vision for Marx's ideology, good times. Well, it all got better after 1920, right? Well, sort of. If you look right to the 1920s, it did result in almost a decade of pretty tremendous, pretty delightful peace and prosperity. And perhaps in a different context, I can unpack what made the Roaring Twenties what they were. But for now, let's just concede that the 1920s were both A, wonderful, and B, a mere interval between the awfulness of 1900 and 1920 and the awfulness of the 1930s and 40s. The Great Depression, the rise of the Third Reich, World War II, and then the springboard to the Cold War that the age of Stalin produced. It's enough to really frustrate those in need of a little pep in their step right now those who need a little encouragement about the arc of history. So 20 years to start the last century, 20 years to start the one we're living. World War I, the Spanish-American War, 9-11, Iran and Afghan wars, ISIS, etc. Financial crisis, 1907, Federal Reserve Act, the housing crisis, Great Recession. Communist Soviets, communist Chinese, Teddy Roosevelt, George Bush, Woodrow Wilson, Barack Obama, antitrust concerns with big oil and steel, antitrust concerns with e-commerce and social media, Spanish flu, COVID-19, Duke Ellington, Kanye West. <laughs> okay. I thought I took that one out. <laughs> History doesn't repeat itself, and maybe it really does rhyme. Well, part of my message tonight is somewhat eschatological, but I mean that far more existentially than I do exegetically. I don't refer to eschatology as a timeline. The sequence of events and spacing of events in the New Testament era, truth be told, are important theologically, not in creating the line graph of history so many are obsessed with, 
when I refer to the theological significance of eschatology, I do believe there is something more important about what I call existential eschatology than exegetical. Parsing out Revelation 20 and key passages in Isaiah are important, and I believe from that exegesis, one should find affirmation of the existential eschatology I'm referring to, but I've known far, far too many people who get some of that exegesis right, yet somehow get all the stuff that matters out of that wrong. And frankly, I've known far too many people who get the exegesis wrong, but get the other stuff right. To ignore much longer the stinging reality that eschatology is important only to the degree it informs our understanding of our existence and our actions in that existence and little else. And I have a sort of concluding takeaway tonight and what those actions and that existence are supposed to be. I will tell you how I use eschatology as a crutch to get me through the moments of exhaustion, fatigue, and exasperation, even as many others use an entirely different set of tools to accomplish the same thing and get to the same place. But I can't even imagine a person naturally holding to wild optimism in the face of our modern age, meaning in the present tense, you are leaving call, you heard the letter that he read earlier, you are leaving college and engaging adult life at a time where the top two candidates to potentially be the president of our country are a man who accidentally almost started kissing his sister on stage, believing her to be his wife, and a man who, well, never mind. <laughs> but you, you know how much material I had to choose from, from the other guy. We have a state that demands the total shutdown of corporate worship and family barbecues but demands the total accommodation of lawless rioting. I spoke to the ridiculousness of our age earlier, and I wonder if any of you have seen pro sports start up lately, where about 10 basketball players, five on five, get on the court and sweat and breathe and battle all over each other, bodies draped on top of each other, but then when they go to the, be the bench, space out 10 feet from each other in a private box. TV anchors and coaches who are tested two times a day stand 10 feet from each other for an interview wearing masks when they conduct an interview. This ridiculousness has, not, has, has transcended something to laugh about and become something that gets in that category of the severe, the serious. I should just use the drama of global terrorism, financial instability, and Chinese ascendancy to make my point about the unsettling instability of our time, but I'm sorry, I'm not so sure the basketball example, this comic book presidential race are mere comic relief. I believe it all comes from the same place, even in the ramifications of some things that are obviously more severe than the ramifications of others. You know, Postman said we're amusing ourselves to death, but I think we're infantilizing ourselves to death. We're not serious, we're not equipped, we are simply not ready for the moment. The moments of the 20th century required men and women of courage, but also men and women of gravitas, of preparation, and of seriousness. Significant mistakes were made in the 20th century, and significant moments of progress and heroism took place. The 20th century gave us some serious but bad actors, Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Dewey, Franklin Roosevelt, Gore Vidal, Lyndon Johnson, Noam Chotsky, but it also gave us very serious and very good actors, Calvin Coolidge, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Winston Churchill, C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, William Buckley. And I think of all the famous bad guys and famous good guys of the 20th century and what they did to change the world for bad and for good, most of the accolades that are given to them are warranted, but what changed the world in the 20th century for the better and what changed the 20th century for the world for the worse always involved a feedback loop with the people, the masses, the you and me. Strong leadership can lead to a strong population, and a weak population can and will lead to weak leadership. But regardless of where you net out on the chicken and egg there, the point is self-reinforcing cycles get set, they feed off each other, and they either do tremendous good or tremendous bad. So I define my eschatology this way. I have a very optimistic view of the past, and therefore I have a very optimistic view of the future. The only thing that sometimes doesn't receive my vote of optimism is the present. And even then, it's rank sin and fear taking over. How is eschatology a view of the past? For me, I simply mean that my theology of the past, which informs my existential purpose today, 
the purpose I want to talk to you graduates about tonight is rooted in my understanding of creation and redemption and the resurrection. The cross and the empty grave were a couple thousand years ago, and history has never been the same. How is eschatology a view of the future? I simply mean God achieving his redemptive purposes in history. And since I am living in that history, its climax is a forward-looking event. There is no doubt about how it will end, and that is because of my understanding of the past. 9-11 broke my heart. It truly did. The financial crisis rocked me to my core and had profound significance in my life. I have no doubt that the events of 1900 to 1920 had an unbelievable impact on the mentality and mission of countless men and women of faith last century. And even when their hopes and dreams and occasional bouts of relief and excitement were met with the Great Depression and World War II, men and women of seriousness carried the responsibility to attack the challenges of that century head on and do so with conviction and character. Now maybe you think that the men and women of the 20th century don't provide a great model for how you have to attack the challenges of this new century. Perhaps you look at the boomer generation and the millennials and think you want a different model. Well, I'd be talking my own book to point out that Gen X is the truly underrated generation here, ignored by the debacle generations that sandwich us. So we're the sort of underrated group in the middle here, but I digress. Here is what I will leave you with tonight as you celebrate graduation in a time of unsettled uncertainty, excuse me, the COVID era, the laughing stock of these social justice wars and everything else going on around us. The awful start to the 20th century had virtually no counter in the church. The advent of modernism and humanism caught the church totally off guard and that is the war we're fighting now. The 20th century did indeed fight through the ups and downs of the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the social unrest of the 1960s, the stagflation of the 1970s. It was a century of unbelievable bloodshed and tumult, no doubt. But we somehow, some way, ended the 20th century with a whole lot of serious people of faith totally engulfed in what the Bible had to say to modern living in the modern world. Retreatism, fundamentalism, and anti-intellectualism were the defining marks of the church, 1900 to 1920. And maybe you think 2000 to 2020, we're not doing much better. The Hawaiian shirts and Instagram scandals and large-scale capitulation to woke mobs from the pulpits. But I don't believe those things and those people define what men and women of faith and courage and conviction will be as we exit 2020 and navigate the uncertain terrain of what lies ahead. I believe a real and potent remnant has formed throughout our land, fully equipped to be a generation of Bonhoeffers, Lewises, and Schaefers. I believe many of you are equipped to be that generation, to be those leaders, to be those followers. What it will take to ensure a better final 80 years than first 20 years of this century is seriousness. This is a serious moment. Do you see that? Do you feel that? Our ideological and theological rivals have explicitly embraced a worldview and an operative practice of extended adolescence. You don't have to do that. Many churches have bowed to a mandate to not worship that is as silly as it is tyrannical. The good churches don't have to do that. I hope the bad churches keep not meeting. Let the co courageous ones who have truth to share be trendsetters. As an aside, I would not have guessed that John MacArthur would prove to be the bravest pastor in the country. I'm glad to see it, though, truly. But in this moment, in this period, you enter the next phase of adult life in a tumultuous time, a part of what has been a tumultuous century, but you have a better understanding of the past and a better understanding of the future than the world does. My exhortation to you as your friend, and as a fellow laborer in the cause of advancing Christ's kingdom here on earth is to be serious, to be ready for the occasion, to be opportunistic. In 100 years, men and women will not likely look back as, at the first 20 years as the most profound moments of the century. We need to be ready to be a part of what those most profound moments will be. You can change the world 100 years at a time. Trust and obey. History is calling for it. Thank you very much.